I have a question for you. A riddle for you. Some people are crisscross applesauce. You can be any way that you're comfortable and have enough room so you don't bump into somebody. Now, I don't want to be a stranger. What do you think my name is? What do you think my name might be? She's George. George is my name. And I am curious, that's why I like libraries, because you get to find out all kinds of things. But, I am not a monkey. <laughs> By name, I'm George Shannon. Who I am is more all about stories. I was lucky, I grew up before television, and I was read to a great deal. And when I got to be old enough to read, I began to read to my three younger brothers. And since I wanted to be a writer, I was always making up stories and started writing them. And eventually, they've been published for the last 30-some years. Making stories, talking about stories, helping people find stories that they have but don't know they know is who I am. We are going to do a story together because I have never heard this story before. Curious, George. A frog. <laughs> and... A duck. A duck. A glowing duck. A glowing duck and a frog. I need some ideas from you about what could happen in the story. What, so, what is something that could happen to the frog? What do you think might happen to the frog? Uh huh. And I read a book about owls and some owls eat frogs. Uh oh, then he might be in danger if there's an owl looking for a frog. That could be a problem. What's another possibility? Well, one of the things that I wanted to do was not read a story that I already had pictures because that would plant and sort of close down, I think, the imagination. This I wanted them to learn that they could really think of their own pictures. So we did, I shared a folk tale that had lots of imagery in it so they could literally experience. They were seeing things in their head. They were making up the movie in their head. And then when we started to work on a story, it was not point by point by point, but to do a miniature version of my writing journal, where I would think of, well, so-and-so could be in the story, so-and-so could be in the story. What's their relationship? To explore. A duck and its mouth invite, the duck and its mouth invite really hard. Ah, now let's say, if the fox does try and bite the duck, what could the frog do to help the duck? Oh, fantasy is... Luckily, at the center of children's lives, and if adults are lucky, it's at the center of their lives. I'll steal something from Einstein. A woman asked him at one point, what should I read to my child to make him a great scientist? And Einstein said, fairy tales. Oh, well, that's nice, and I did that when he was younger, but what should I read to my child to make sure he becomes a great scientist? Fairy tales. If you cannot learn to imagine what doesn't exist, you can't invent anything. You can't cure something, you can't write the poem, you can't build a better mousetrap. So the fantasy, that's how new things develop. That's how you know you can do something you thought you couldn't do. That's how you learn to get along with people that you were first afraid of. So it's about everything. What could the duck do? You think the duck will just sit there and say, well, it looks like I'm going to be dinner. Might as well get it over with. Bring on the gravy. What could the duck do? What's something else they might try? Uh -huh. uh, am I flock to get the, the fox? Children play dress up because they're trying to learn how to be a person. Children play house because they're trying to learn, imagine what it's going to be. If you're going to write something, you have to imagine something that hasn't been written before or in a way it hasn't been written. You're not going to be a scientist if you can't imagine an answer to a question that hasn't even been asked yet. So to spend time playing and imagining it's what it's all about. I am going to tell you the story that you helped me make about the duck and the frog. So, we're going to make it up. And you are going to help me at the end. Me? Everybody's going to help me at the end because once there were two great friends. The little duck and the frog and every day they would visit and they would share secrets and they would look up and see if any birds were flying around to see if they'd gotten away from the hunter and if they were having a party. So often, especially children, but often adults as well, 
when they start to make something, they will latch on to the first idea and then they feel trapped. They don't like it as much anymore. But now they hate the whole process. So if we can play around a little bit and come up with options, I would ask them several different plot points and then I told the story back to them so they could see that their architecture of ideas could be expressed in a wider way, add language, play around with it a little bit. And then after they've heard that and experience the story that they helped create, say, I don't have an ending yet. I need you to draw what's going to happen at the end. And because we had the energy of the story going up to it, they very quickly had answers they wanted to draw. And the duck began to flash. <laughs> on, off, on, off, on, off, on. And at first they thought it was fun because they could see each other in the dark. But then they heard an owl come by going... <laughs> <laughs> his big wings and they go, help, help, the owl's gonna get us. And then the duck crawled inside and the frog stayed inside and they turned it over, upside down, the hole on the bottom. And what do you think happened after that? That's what I need you to help me with. Now we have paper and crayons, and I need you to help me and draw a picture of the very end of the story. So I know what happened. You help me get it started, and now I need you to help me finish. Would you do that for me? So we'll get the paper and the crayons, and then I'm gonna come around. Basically, you cannot separate story and image, folk tales were never illustrated before print came along, but everybody was making their own images. When the novelist writes, his or her job is to spark imagery in you, the reader. So together, one of the things that I notice time and again with children is that the fine motor skills needed to write words and sentences is very laborious. It's harder than coming up with the story ideas. They can't write as fast as they think. They're afraid of getting it wrong. But when you can say, like, what happens next in the story, and rather than ask them to write sentences, they can draw what happens, it's there on the page much quicker. And they can tell you the whole story about it and haven't been confined by the small motor skills. So when children are allowed to, at least in part, draw the stories they're creating, they are freer to go farther and find out they can do much more than they thought they could. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when it's all black, I get a little nervous. I'm done. I'm making the dog. The, I'm making the, the duck. Making, I'm making the duck, look. <laughs> if you can really pay attention so what a child is drawing that can guide the questions that you might ask where their story might go or what kind of concerns they have. If we didn't have the dialogue, I wouldn't know what the picture was and I wouldn't know what her story was and she wouldn't know as much about her story because she hadn't verbalized it. They think that the owl might not get them. They're feeling good. What do you think they might do to celebrate? If the owl gives up, what do you think they might do to celebrate? Uh, they might invite their friends over and they'll, and, 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 uh... They could play bingo. Yeah. Or they could play disco dancing. Yeah. Or they could play twister. Yeah. We could work with children in their drawings and help them identify what they were adding to the story, how they were changing things, so they begin to develop a vocabulary for what goes into a story. I see. The owl was over and they came out of the pumpkin into the water. Oh, he doesn't look very happy. Yeah. Why do you think he's not very happy? Because he can't find, because he, he's, 
He locked in the pumpkin and he didn't find him. He can't find the yeah. duck and the frog he wanted to eat. Yeah. And when we were brainstorming with the kids, it was never, tell me somebody to be in the story. Tell me what they're going to do. It was, let's think of three things that could happen in the story. So you come up with options. We're thinking, we're fantasizing as we go and learn not to take our first answer as absolute. To play around with it, get the pieces, rearrange it, and keep asking questions. What kind of party do you think they might have? Jump back in the fun and splash each other. Then you can, can you draw me that picture? Yeah. Okay. The, the owl? No, the duck. Oh, the duck and? When the owl was coming, there was two pumpkins and he didn't know where to go. Oh, two pumpkins! So he went to that one, uh -huh. and he found doors, so he went there. And he went in? And this makes me think of a rainbow. Yeah. Yeah, and what is all this black about? No, that's the, where the owl can't go. Oh, he can't go through there? Yeah, and when the owl comes back, they have a limited force field, so... They oh, they go. have the force field! And then he can go there. Oh, you have it. You added a stallion chasing away the owl. Teamwork! Just like those birds. So the pumpkin and the horse and the stallion, the owl, and I forgot. What I think for children, especially, and adults if they would allow it, that drawing is an opportunity to take delight in the process enjoy the process rather than being fixated on the product and what are people going to think about it. That's the frog and that's the duck. The orange beak and a green frog and a big pumpkin and it's so dark inside it's black. Yeah. Most children love to draw until they think they have to draw something just right or until they have to please somebody. So I think especially drawing more than writing allows exploration in the process and it's just fun. So it's the, it's the play element, the improvisation. It's what? What do you think they will do next when they that's go home? A, that's a sign and it says don't ever go in the house. Don't ever go in the house, why not? Because don't go in the punk in our house because those are predators who eat him and him. Oh, so it's sort of like a sign for the owl to say don't go in the pumpkin. But now he's dead. Oh. It's really about listening and not assuming anything. In order for me to work with the children and help them stretch a little bit or grow or add something to their drawing or story, it is about very careful listening. And I think one of the reasons they begin to respond, I'm genuinely interested in what they're drawing, how they're thinking, and it's about them and their work. And they begin to relax. For the very same reason why we as adults, when we know we're really being listened to, when we know we're being respected, we open up. We'll take chances. We will try something that we wouldn't try if we thought we were going to be judged. Thank you for ending the story. I made it all on my own. You did, exactly. That's what's fun about stories.